Uh, yeah, I Good. think Alan, Done. Yeah, he's, he's doing it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you very much. And welcome, everybody. And let me just share my screen because I think, yeah, that's it. So we're on, on to the redemption of the remnant. And this is part two, Cyrus and the fall of Babylon. Very exciting stuff. And so just to recap some of the things we said last time. So we observed that God's purpose in judging Israel was to bring them to repentance. And despite being more privileged than any nation has ever been, Israel rebelled against the Lord again and again until the Lord said in 2 Chronicles 36, 16, there is no remedy. Remember, that's the last chapter in 2 Chronicles. And we noted the similarities between rebellious, sinful Israel and our own society. The Lord punished Israel for their iniquity again and again by putting them under lockdowns. That's the way I mischievously put it. The, the end of it, this was the exile to Assyria for the northern kingdom for Israel in 722 BC. That's the date that Chris says we must remember. And the exile to Babylon for the southern kingdom for Judah. So the Judean exile began in 605 BC and culminated in 586 BC with the, with the total destruction of Jerusalem and its temple and almost all the remaining Jews being carried off to Babylon. Uh, we'll do a bit more about that later. But the, the Lord was also chastising Israel, not just punishing them. He wanted to bring them to repentance. He wanted them to return to himself. He told them, remember in Jeremiah, he was giving them a future and a hope. And that the, the exile, the Babylonian exile, would be ju uh, for just 70 years. After that, they would return. And we started to see that the Lord redeemed the remnant of Israel in a, in a wonderful way. That is, he brought them back to the land of Israel following the Assyrian and Babylonian exiles. So God planned it. He prophesied it. He moved world leaders and powers around to achieve it. He carried it out and the remnant came into it. It was the remnant who returned. It was the remnant who came into the good of what God spoke to Israel through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29. And we also saw the challenge of what it is to be part of the, the remnant. And even now, God is saving his remnant. It says in Romans 11, 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And we ended by saying that although to obey God and to go on that long journey back to Israel from Babylon, not knowing how they would live or what awaited them and so on, although that may have seemed daunting to the Jews, <clears throat> all they really needed to do was take one step and trust the Lord, then take another step and so on. And so it is with us. So last time we went on a journey and we got to the end or near the end, we got to the point in Ezra 1 where the Jews were leaving Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. And so today we, we, we go on another journey. Uh, in one sense, it's the same journey. Uh, it is nearly the same end point, but we're going to go on a different route. So once again, I want to use verses from Romans 8 as, as the backdrop. So this is Romans 8, 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, 
these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And we saw last time that God is working out all things for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. It, it is his purpose that he is working to. Then in verse 29 and 30 here, we have what seems to me to be some of the most remarkable statements in the, in the Bible. So let me use a, an analogy to illustrate this. Here's, here's a, hang on a minute. Yeah, there's a house in the mountains, relatively close up, so you can see quite a lot of details. But as, as we zoom out, you can see less and less detail, but you can see more and more. How about that? <clears throat> uh, eventually, we can see everything. And in, in the same way, in, in verse 29 and 30 here of Romans 8, it, it seems to me that we've zoomed out very far and can see everything. Because in those two verses, you have the whole of God's purpose for his elect from eternity past to eternity future. It says God foreknew us. He predestined us. He called us, and that was the first we knew about it. He justified us, and he will glorify us. But amazingly, uh, writing under the inspiration of God, Paul writes it as if it has already happened, all of it. Even the, even the glorification, he says, these he also glorified. Because clearly glorification, that is entering into the eternal state when we have new bodies and when all the effects and results of sin are no longer felt or known. And when we dwell with him in, in glory forever, what we were reading about in Revelation 21, 22 with Les. Glorification is in the future for us. But God, through Paul, speaks of it as if it's already done. In his foreknowledge, this is how God often speaks. For example, his Isaiah 21, verse 9. And in the middle there, you can see uh, God says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. By the way, if I put verses up and there's blue bits, it's usually the blue bits I'm referring to, or even just bits of the blue bits. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is Isaiah. But at that time, Babylon wasn't wasn't the power that it was going to be. Um, Babylon, that I think it's called the, 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 the Neo-Kingdom of Babylon, something like that. That is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon hadn't really even begun. I, I, Isaiah spoke these words in 21 verse 9 in about 714 BC, 714 BC. But Babylon didn't rise to be the dominant power until about 625 BC. And Babylon didn't fall until 539 BC, uh, 175 years after Isaiah prophesied it. But let me say it again. The fact that God has foreknowledge and he predestines does not mean that no one else has any say in it. The Bible teaches us the opposite. All the players in the game, <clears throat> so to speak, are making their own decisions, their own choices, their own moves. They're not robots in, in, in the slightest. We are determining our own futures by the choices we make. <clears throat> We're not puppets on strings. But in some way, which I think it is not possible for our finite minds to grasp, uh, whether we'll ever grasp it in eternity, I don't know. But in some way, God can do and does do the impossible. He foreknows and predestines <coughs> um, things. And at the same time, he leaves, he leaves it entirely in the hands of men and angels uh, to fashion the future for themselves. So now we come to the, the fall of Babylon. And what we're going to learn is what we know already. 
not really telling you much you, you don't know, I don't think. What we're going to learn is that Babylon will fall. Amen. Babylon is only temporary. It is only the kingdom of God that is permanent, as we've heard in Leslie's studies on Revelation. So as the people of God, we need to firstly get out, get out of Babylon, that is spiritually get out of Babylon. Even if we have to live in Bam Babylon like Daniel did, we don't have to be spiritual partakers of Babylon. Daniel wasn't. A person could even be involved in running Babylon as Daniel was <clears throat> to a large extent at times without being of Babylon. Fancy being Nebuchadnezzar's minister, one of his chief advisors, part of his government. Fancy being a minister in the government of Antichrist. You say it's not possible. <clears throat> you, you, you would have to take the mark of the beast, but, but you wouldn't. You would refuse. You'd have the, 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 the choice. Daniel refused. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all refused. But you, you say that then you'd be killed and removed, and that's very probable. Or you might be thrown into a fire to be burned alive so hot that it kills the, the, the soldiers who throw you in and then be preserved by the Son of God and thereby be the means of perhaps turning Antichrist around so that he declares, as it says in Daniel chapter 3, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Amen. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Anyway, reading that last bit, it seems that uh, perhaps Nebuchadnezzar only made a partial turn, or did he turn at all? He still wants to dominate everyone else's life, and he won't tolerate any resistance whatsoever. But it ends there, verse 30, where it says, <clears throat> then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The men of God were in key positions in Babylon, kingdom of Antichrist, I'm calling it. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar was a, a serious Marduk worshipper, but we won't go into what that means. But he, he was a devil worshipper. God tried to reach him, of course. But there, there is, I don't know if any of you looked at any of my notes and I posed a question. If you read Daniel 3 and Revelation 13, uh, what is similar about them? And I, th I think that there's a, there's a remarkable similarity between Daniel chapter 3 and Revelation 13. In Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar, the tyrant king, sets up a huge image to be worshipped. So there's no freedom of conscience, no freedom of belief or of worship. Everyone is compelled to worship the image. Whoever disobeys will be sent for the chop, so to speak, in a most unpleasant way that is roasted alive and then in revelation 13 i've just picked out a few verses here the the, the second beast there in verse 11 the one who it says in verse 12 exercises all the authority of the first beast that is the antichrist the first beast is the antichrist verse 14 it tells us that this second beast told those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the first beast, the Antichrist, who was wounded by the sword and lived. Then in verse 15, he compels everyone to worship the image and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There's no freedom of conscience. There's no freedom of belief or of worship. Everyone is compelled to worship the image. Whoever disobeys will be killed, as in Daniel 3. 
But praise God, there are those who disobey, who refuse, who love not their lives un unto the death. Millions of our brothers and sisters have already refused to compromise and they've, they've paid the price. And thousands upon thousands, if not more, are, are this very day standing firm in the face of persecution. Praise God. They, they don't and they wouldn't bow to the image of the beast when they were presented with it. <clears throat> they, 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 they were being told, we want to see the mark in your right hand. We want to see the way you are handling things and what you are doing. Or we want to see the mark in your forehead, the way you are thinking, your attitudes, your beliefs. And if we don't like what we see, if we don't see the mark of the beast, we'll forbid you from buying and selling. You'll become destitute. You will starve. It's been going on for the last two millennia. It, it continues to go on uh, today in, in some places. Uh, I think perhaps we can even see it moving that way in our own uh, society. But whether we actually get to that extreme, I don't know. But it seems to me that if we want to know what Babylon is, what Antichrist is, uh, perhaps Antichrist with a small a, I don't know about with a capital A, but I expect it's the same. Perhaps we, we, we don't need to look any, any further. In, in, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is told by Daniel, you are this head of gold. You remember the, that, that's, that's, Daniel, that's Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel tells him the dream and he interprets it. You are this head of gold. And then in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image of gold not just a head, a, a, a whole body, and elevated to a huge height. It really was big. It was about 90 feet tall. And everyone has to, uh, uh, to worship the image. And in <clears throat> Revelation uh, chapter 13, <clears throat> we have a similar thing. I just have to find it <clears throat> because I've just lost it on my notes and i'm afraid i can't i can't manage this without my notes <clears throat> um the antichrist sets up an image of himself everyone has to worship the image babylon antichrist is the worship of self uh it's a fact isn't it that certain types of leaders want their image to be everywhere hitler stalin Mao, Xi Jinping, and so on. And of course, that's, this is a bug that doesn't just affect uh, leaders. Uh, celebrities can be like it. I'm not suggesting all celebrities are like it. Non-celebrities -ce can, can want to be like it. How many these days dream of being a celebrity and seeing their picture anywhere? But everywhere, I mean, but, but at a certain level, all unregenerate human beings are like it, the worship of self. There's the self worship of self, i.e. worshiping yourself. Then there's the expectation and desire that others should worship one. You know, I deserve to be admired. Look at how clever I am, et cetera, et cetera. Look at what I've achieved. See all my work and achievements. Um, it seems to be an aspect of human life. And then, I don't know if this has got anything <laughs> to do with it, but there's the, uh, the worldwide epidemic pandemic of selfies. <clears throat> anyway, I'll leave you to find <laughs> that one. Um, <clears throat> but God's uh, redeemed remnant tell a different story. They say, why should God love a person, a wretch like me. Why should he die for me? Wonderful. If it had not been for his mercy and grace, I would be cast into the eternal lake of fire, which, of course, is where the Antichrist is heading. I'd be cast there, and deservedly so. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved me, he saved me. And the people of God give all the glory to God forever and ever. Amen.
But so this this brings us to the the second point uh, regarding what must Christians do in regard to Babylon. We must not be afraid of Babylon, uh, as Daniel and his friends weren't. Um, Mike Houghton thinks we should all read a book called I don't know if you've heard him say this called Captive in Iran. Uh, so uh, very obediently, I've started reading it. And it's about two Iranian girls who, who went to prison and were absolutely unafraid. They just kept preaching and witnessing and praying for people and, and God opened so many doors for them in, in prison. They weren't afraid of Babylon. Um, <clears throat> but but that, that means we, we must have transa act, transacted with God to lose our lives for him today. Now, every day, I, I don't think it's any good waiting until the crisis comes. If I'm not ready now, when the crisis comes, I won't be ready then. Those, those two girls, they, they, they made up their minds <clears throat> long before they were ever arrested, how they would uh, behave. We've got to have died today and every day. To me, it seems like it's the it's the ABC of becoming a, a a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what we did we did years to do years ago, or at least we're supposed to have done. And it seems to me it's what it's what people in the uh, persecuted church find ordinary, but people in the non persecuted church can sometimes find it difficult to face up to because of too much ease, I guess. Jesus said, if, if you're going to build a tower, make sure you've got the resources to finish it. He's talking about basic discipleship. So what are the resources? Yielding our lives to God, <clears throat> having the sentence of death in ourselves, dying daily, taking up our cross daily and following him, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, faith. Amen. So the, the, the fall of Babylon. In 722 BC, long before the fall of Babylon, <clears throat> Israel is exiled to Assyria. This is the departure of the 10 tribes, as you know. Uh, so as you know, only Judah and a few extras were left in the land of Israel from this time. At that time, Assyria was the dominant world power, and they were a very cruel lot, so it seems. Uh, but this is the time, around this time, Isaiah and others were prophesying. Isaiah prophesied from about 745 BC to about 685 BC. But in 625 BC, uh, 100 years later, Nebuchadnezzar's father, He's called uh, Nabo Palasa, I think, Nabo Palasa, the king of Babylon. He freed himself from the Assyrian yoke. So that, that is important, I think, because it means Babylon was establishing itself as the, the biggest world power in the region instead of Assyria. And then in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar defeats Egypt at the Battle of uh, Carchemish. And as far as I know, that event was decisive in establishing Babylon as the regional world power. There's some bits about it in the, in the scripture. Um, <clears throat> but before Babylon A ever became the dominant world power, the Lord had prophesied Babylon's fall. I don't know that so much is prophesied about the, the rise of Babylon uh, as, as I've written here, the Battle of Carchemish is spoken of by Jeremiah in chapter 44 uh, because of its significance, I guess. I didn't realize that, but I just happened to be last few weeks reading through um, Jeremiah and I got up to it. And much of chapter 44 is devoted to the Battle of uh, Carchemish. Um, but <clears throat> so I don't know so much about the rise of Babylon uh, being talked of in the scripture but but quite a number of times and in several different ways God spoke of the fall and destruction of 
Babylon. For example, Isaiah 13. I think yes, I've got some bits from my Isaiah 13. So, so this is about the destruction of Babylon. And the, the, the whole chapter is relevant, uh, but we'll only look at a few verses. So among other things, Isaiah predicts in, in verse 6 here uh, that... Uh, 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 oh, I've got the wrong... Sorry. No, I have got it right. The, 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 the destruction of Babylon would be from the Almighty. And then in verse 17, chapter 13, verse 17, that a Babylon would fall to the Medes. And it happened. Babylon fell to Cyrus. He was the ruler of the Medes, Persians. And then in verse 20, that Babylon would never be inhabit, inhabited again. Um, it also happened. Eventually, uh, Babylon lingered on for some time, for some centuries, actually, under the Persians. And it was still there uh, uh, when Alexander the Great visited. And in fact, Alexander the Great returned to Babylon after some of his conquests. And he actually died there, apparently. But I, I, I've got a quote here. This is, uh, I, I, if you want to know where I got it from, I can tell you. But this is what somebody said. To predict permanent desolation for a sprawling city occupying a strategic location was bold indeed. You would normally expect that such a city would be rebuilt if ruined. Although Babylon lingered on for a while after its conquest, Isaiah's words eventually uh, came true. Today, the site of ancient Babylon is flat, hot, deserted, and dusty. I'm not sure when he wrote this, um, because in fact now a lot of it has been excavated. And I don't know if you know, but in the in the, in the 20th century, in, in the 1990s, I think, Saddam Hussein rebuilt the palace of Babylon at, at Babylon. Uh, but a lot, quite so, some of the spectacular bits of Babylon are now in the in the I think it's called the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. If you're ever in Berlin, it's very well worth visiting and seeing the Ishtar Gate and all sorts. We we went there once. We took our children there. So Jeremiah also uh, predicted the fall of mighty Babylon in chapters 50 and 15, uh, 51 writing in about 595 BC. So Jeremiah, just look at, don't worry about all the black bits, just look at the, the blue bits. Um, Jeremiah lived through all the terrible events of the fall of Jerusalem. He, he saw Nebuchadnezzar take the city three times, that's in 605, 597 and 586 BC. He had to do it three times because it seems the Jews were such terrible rebels uh, they were very uncooperative. So to the people living then in Israel and all the, all the nations around there, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon must have appeared invincible, it seems to me. Even Nebuchadnezzar himself gives the impression that he thought he was invincible. If you, if you think about some of the things he, he said in, 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 in Daniel. Um, but Jeremiah wrote about the doom of Babylon in, as I said, in chapters 50 and 51. It actually says he wrote about it on a single scroll. So this is right at the end of chapter 51. This is 51 verse 60. And it says, so Jeremiah wrote in a single sc uh, scroll all the disaster which would come on Babylon, that is, all these words which have been written concerning Babylon. Then Jeremiah said to Sarah, so Jeremiah, I think Saraya was some servant or other of Jeremiah's or colleague, I don't know, but he sent, he, 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 he told um, Saraya to go to Babylon. Jeremiah, verse 61, Jeremiah said to Saraya, when you come to Babylon, see to it that you read all these words aloud and say, you, O Lord, have promised concerning this place to cut it off and destroy it so that there shall be nothing living in it, neither man nor animal, but it will be perpetually desolate. And as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you shall tie a stone to it 
and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates. You know, Babylon is built on the river Euphrates. Then say, in the same way, Babylon will sink down and not rise because of the disaster that I will bring on her. And the, and the Babylonians will become hopelessly exhausted. Thus, the words of Jeremiah are completed. And the next chapter, 52, which is the last chapter in Jeremiah, is, is a bit of history about Zedekiah and the fall of Jerusalem and so on. So this was the scroll. Scroll Chapters 50 and 51 were, were on this one scroll, and, and uh, Saraya took it to Babylon. But uh, fortunately for us, uh, Jeremiah wrote it down again so we can read what he said. And he, he says, um, <clears throat> There you've got it in verse one, the word that the Lord spoke concerning Babylon. So I've just picked out a few verses again. So verse three, he says that the conqueror will come out of the north. That's the Medes, because Media was north of um, Babylon. It's actually north, northeast, really. I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, northeast. And uh, he, he repeats it in verse 41. Behold, a people is coming from the north. And then in chapter 51, verse 11, it says in the middle there, the Lord has stirred up uh, the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose concerning Babylon is to destroy it. So God is, 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 is telling us what's going to happen. Um, and he says there it's because the reason he's doing it is because um, Babylon had destroyed God's temple. And then in chapter 50, going back to chapter 50 and verses four to five, it says <clears throat> that, uh, that the children of Israel will come and with repentant weeping, if you, if you look at it there, and ask the way back to Zion. And then in, in chapter 50, verse 19, it says that, that God... Uh, would bring Israel home again. Israel would return to the land of Israel. And then in, in 33 to 34, it, it says Israel will be redeemed. Verse 34, their redeemer is strong and he will bring them, bring rest to their land, but turmoil to the inhabitants of Babylon. So that, that, there's that all the whole of these two chapters are about this sort of thing. So there's much more about it uh, and in other places in the, the prophets of course but by far the most staggering prophecies about the fall of babylon in my view are the, are the ones in isaiah about cyrus so cyrus uh began his rule in about 600 bc that's ruling over the medes and persians so Babylon was the dominant uh, world empire, if you like, but there's the Medes and Persians. They had their own ruler and so on. So Cyrus was the man. And the Medes and Persians were kowtowing to the, the big bosses of Babylon and especially to Nebuchadnezzar. But <clears throat> in about 712 BC, that's um, it's so I put nearly a hundred years earlier. It's actually over <laughs> over a hundred years earlier, isn't it? Isaiah uh, was writing Cyrus's bi biography. He was prophesying and writing Cyrus's biography long before Cyrus was ever uh, born. Sorry, I've lost my place in my my notes again. Um, because my notes are on the, on the phone. And if you touch the wrong bit of phone, it suddenly scro all scrolls uh, down. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the thing is, I better not show you that. You might read it while I'm talking, you see. That's what Tony always used to say. Don't give them any notes to read. They won't listen to what you say. They'll just be reading the notes. Anyway, God knows. He has foreknowledge. He speaks through his prophets. And of course, this is one of the reasons why the Bible is, is unique amongst uh, all the books of the world. Uh, it predicts with 100% accuracy so far the future. And of course, obviously for us 
much as of what it's predicted is now history. But <clears throat> this is um, Isaiah 44. Now, you might find it worthwhile turning up this chapter 44 and 45 because we're going to spend a bit of time here. And th these are just actually aston absolutely astonishing verses. But it says here, uh, he says, <clears throat> remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant and so on. I formed you, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. And then in verse 22, he says, I blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Now, of course, he's writing all this stuff a um, hundred and something years before any of it happened. And then he said in verse 23, Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. God speaks about the future as if it's already uh, happened. Do you remember we read the verse in um, Romans 8? Um, and whom he justified, he also glorified. <clears throat> it's the same sort of principle. So God is talking about the redemption of Israel. But I think the context tells us he's talking about the redemption of, of the remnant. It's the remnant that would return from Babylon after 539 BC, when Babylon fell in 539 BC. So here, um, <clears throat> let, let, let's read this. It says, thus says the Lord, your redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. Um, this is 44 verse 24. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and dr drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their, fo uh, their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited to the cities of Judah. You shall be built and I will raise up her waste places. Well, the thing is that <laughs> Jerusalem, what, when, when Isaiah wrote this, of course, Jerusalem was inhabited and was built up. But Isaiah is writing it as if, as if um, Jerusalem is, is desolate. And God, God is predicting the future. The, it, it did become desolate when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it in 586 uh, BC. He, he destroyed the temple. He destroyed Jerusalem. He made it a wilderness. Verse 27, who says to the, the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. I think that's probably a reference to Babylon. But this is the point here. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure saying to Jerusalem, you shall be rebuilt, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. I don't know if you get uh, excited about this sort of stuff, but I mean, it's just so remarkably uh, e exciting uh, reading this. Um, <clears throat> he said, verse 26, he's saying to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited. Uh, verse 28, eight, we, we just read that, what it says of uh, of, of Cyrus. It's absolutely uh, amazing. God, uh, you remember this, this is over a hundred years before Cyrus came uh, to the throne. Many, many years, probably a hundred years before he was born or whatever. Um, God knew Cyrus even before he existed. And he knew he would become the all-powerful leader in the region. And he even knew what Cyrus would think and <clears throat> what he would say. And it would all be aligned with God's own predestined purpose. And it happened. Uh, we read it twice last week in Ezra 1. Remember the beginning of Ezra 1? Uh, we read about Cyrus giving the command. And then Chris read it to us again, the end of 2 Chronicles 36. Cyrus gave the command for Jerusalem and the temple to be uh, rebuilt. So we asked the question, how could God do that? 
uh, was Cyrus a robot who was just programmed by God to do and say those things? The answer is no. <laughs> Cyrus made his own uh, choices. Choices. Cyrus was not even a good man. He's been described as a despot. And when when he he took over Babylon, um, he 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 adopted. He he was he became a fervent Marduk worshipper, the idol Marduk. Uh, he, I don't think he was on his knees seeking the will of God. Uh, he, he was doing what dictators do. He was seeking to dominate other people. But the thing is that God foreknows and he predestines and he brings his plans about. But at the same time, people independently make choices which at any moment could go right against the will of God. But God. But God is able to make all things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. He's working towards his purpose. His purpose is to do with his people, the ones who love him. And of course, he will do it. And he does do it. How does he do it? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows, but he does it. And all the time, he's leaving free to make their, people free to make their own uh, choices. <clears throat> so it says here, verse 28, that God says, he, that is Cyrus, is, is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure. And yet God says twice that Cyrus would not know him. Let me just see if I've got that one here. Yes, look, in the next chapter, this is Isaiah 45, verse for I have named you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. And verse 45, I will gird you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. God says that Cyrus did not know him, would not know him. Cyrus didn't know the Lord. Cyrus made his own pagan uh, choices. Yet Cyrus was used by God to perform all God's pleasure. That's what he says. Look, he shall perform all my pleasure. Verse 28 there. So the Lord writing, uh, speaking through I, uh, Isaiah, who was writing about 712 BC, tells us what he's expecting of uh, Cyrus. And I think I've got it. Let's read this one. Yes, this is Isaiah 45, 1 to 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by your name. I've named you, though you've not known me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So it says here in, in, in verses 1, one to three, that Cyrus is going to subdue nations in a, in a big way. And in particular, he will subdue Babylon, uh, although Babylon isn't named in this passage. Babylon is named in many other passages, uh, including Jeremiah uh, 50, 51 and so on, where it says that the Medes will destroy Babylon. And then it says, the second part of verse three, that <clears throat> God says, to Cyrus, that by observing what happens, Cyrus would know that he, Yahweh, is, is the Lord, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call your name, and the God of Israel. Uh, Cyrus would not know the Lord, but if he opened his eyes, he would be able to see that the Lord is Lord. He is God Almighty, and there is no other God. I think it says it somewhere 
Uh, yes, he says here, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God besides me. Um, and he also says <clears throat> that everyone in the world may know that God is God and he alone. Uh, in verse six to seven, if I've written down the right thing, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting. So that's everyone all over the world, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. He, it seems to me he's saying that you only need to look at this one event in history and you will know that I am almighty God. This is God's apologetics. But of course, we thank God that there, there are many, many such events we can look at which prove that he is the, the Lord. And, and God tells Cyrus why he has raised him up. Uh, to do all his pleasure. Again, at the end of verse three, um, he says uh, that you may know that I, the Lord who call you by your name and the God of Israel. He's telling Cyrus that God is doing what he, he's doing for Israel's sake, for the sake of his remnant people. He says in verse four, for Jacob, my servant's sake and Israel, my elect, I've even called you by name. God has called Cyrus to that position and for that purpose, for the sake of his, his people. Amen. God does what he does for his people. This is why everything happens in the world. It's for the sake of his people. It is to bring glory to God. And it is for the sake of his people. And of course, God, God is calling all people uh, to become his people. And so that, that is why we have this this ruler, leader, and that world leader, and this situation and that situation, God is moving everything around for the sake of his people, uh, so that they will not just be justified, but they, they, they will make it to be glory, to, to glory, as we read in Romans 8, glorified. And so I, I guess if we were ever uh, sitting in, a, in a, a fearful prison in solitary confinement or something, um, it would be good to remember that, that he is working all things together for good for us, for his purpose in our, in our life, uh, which is to bring us to glory. And if we were ever in that situation, we shouldn't just stay in our prison cell. We should be like John Bunyan and go up the mountain to, to meet God, meet him there and enjoy his 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 presence and that's our inheritance as the as the children of god but more importantly because of course uh that is unlikely ever to happen to us may do but seems unlikely um <clears throat> we should remember it today and let it let it bring us uh, alive let us remember it if we're struggling with lockdown or with anything else that he's working all things together for good, for his purpose. And especially, I think we should remember it if we're in ease. Personally, I think that is the most dangerous uh, position for, for Christians, especially for us, for the pilgrim, ease. And we might say that, the, the, you know, the problem is the government, uh, they're incompetent or whatever, they're doing the wrong thing, uh, they shouldn't be keeping us in lockdown, although they're trying to <clears throat> ease off a bit at the moment, aren't they? Or depending on your point of view, they should be locking us down more to keep us all safe. Um, or if, if, if for those who live in so many places in the world, they might say our leaders are evil. They are oppressive. Uh, they're, they're denying human rights. They're denying freedoms. But the thing is, uh, it has always been like that. I mean, I, I doubt if there's ever been a regime which has matched Nebuchadnezzar's uh, for lack of freedom and for oppression. Perhaps the Assyrians did. I don't know. Uh, the absolute control he sought to exercise, uh, uh, exercise over every individual life. I don't know, but I doubt it. And I expect Cyrus was not much better. I don't, I don't know so much about him. And yet... God was working all things out according to his 
uh, purpose. And of course, if we're going to remember these things, let's let's remember our brothers and sisters who were already bound, already under severe oppression and persecution, already in severe trials, which could lead them to despair. And let us, by the grace of God, leave ourselves behind and pray for them. Amen. But very quickly, I can see the times marching on. <laughs> um, back to the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, I, Isaiah says, um, <clears throat> back to verse chapter 44, verse 28, uh, that <clears throat> um, Jerusalem will be restored and that Babylon will fall. But he says it's because it's all done through God's shepherd. He is my shepherd. It happens, the fall of Babylon, the restoration of Jerusalem. It's through his, God's shepherd. So that, that sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? It is God's shepherd. Uh, <clears throat> he's the one who always does uh, those things that please the Father. He is mentioned here, carry out all that I desire, all my good pleasure. Sorry, I put here a different translation. I think this is the amplified version. Um, he's he's the one, that, and he's the only one who can bring down Babylon in anyone's life and bring them into Jerusalem. He has the means to subdue Antichrist. Uh, that is to refocus a person's attention away from self-worship and onto Christ worship, and <clears throat> so to speak. It, see, it seems that for God's shepherd Cyrus, the weapons of his warfare were not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So what, what am I talking about now? So amazingly, the, the fall of Babylon, that great city, that great empire, in the end turned out to be uh, a bit of a non-event. There was no clashing of swords or throwing of spears or year-on-year -year siege. Babylon fell uh, with a whimper. Babylon was a huge impregnable city fortress and the Babylonians themselves considered it to be impossible to conquer. And naturally speaking, it may have been. So when Cyrus was an up and coming power and it became clear that he intended to have a go at conquering Babylon, uh, those who dwelt in the city had no concern whatsoever. Apparently, they actually had enough food in the city to, to be able to withstand many, many years of siege. And the Greek historian Herodotus, um, who lived about 100 years after the event, and uh, he, he tells us how, how Cyrus did it. He, he diverted the, the flow of the great river Euphrates. Uh, Babylon was, uh, was built across across this river. Let, let me just show you this. Um, I'll just, just show you 30 seconds of this video. This is someone's, if I can, if it will go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the, sorry about that bit. <laughs> uh, I forgot to get it ready. Hang on a minute. So the, here, here, just the end of this. So this is, Babylon, and I want to. See, here's the Great River Euphrates. You can see it's. This is someone's impression of it. There's the, the ziggurat, and it's it's built on the built on the Euphrates, and it's just a few seconds of it. Uh, this is quite a nice video to watch. Actually, it's about three minutes long. Um, this is just the end part of it. I just wanted to show you the bits of the river in it. Don't know if that's the end. Oh, there it is again. You see. So uh, anyway, that's enough of that. Um, so <clears throat> Cyrus diverted the, 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 the river and Herod this is quoting now, Herod Herodotus said, the river sank to such an extent that the natural bed of the stream became fordable so that during one night, the, the medium Persian soldiers marched along the riverbed and walk right through the gates, some of which would have been uh, underwater. And they were so confident that they hadn't even locked those gates. 
And Herodotus says, had the Babylonians been apprised of what Cyrus was about, they would have made fast all the street gates which were upon the river. But as it was, the Persians came upon them by surprise and took the, the city. And at the time, the Babylonians were having a drunken feast, as, as is recorded in, in Daniel chapter 5, and Herodotus confirmed that. So God's shepherd conquered Babylon, but not with carnal weapons. There's also some other aspects. Actually, the people welcomed uh, Cyrus and so on. We haven't got time to go into all that. But the thing is, it's God's shepherd who conquered Babylon. And it's God's true shepherd who continues to conquer Babylon. He declares Babylon is fallen. He cries it is finished. He's the one who does have a sword uh, coming out of his mouth. It's the word of God. He also has a bow. He's going forth conquering into conquer and the city of Babylon cannot stand uh, before him and it's God's true shepherd <clears throat> who declares liberty to the captives and shows them the way to Zion the heavenly city amen anyway you'll be pleased to know I have finished let's just pray shall we thank you father we do thank you for your word and how inspirational it is and how <clears throat> lord you have foreknowledge you predestine things and yet lord things are also in our own hands and we can't get our minds around it but you do it lord and we thank you for this great event in history where we see that babylon fell to your shepherd who is doing all your pleasure and we thank you lord that <clears throat> in, he's a sort of a type of you, Jesus, you caused Babylon to fall, this worship of self, you, call, you cause it to fall, you eradicate it, Lord, and you bring your people unto yourself in Mount Zion. Amen. Amen. Amen.